Hello, I'm Amy O'Donnell, the Texas Alliance for Life Communications Director, and I'm joined today by our Executive Director, Dr. Joe Poyman. Welcome to this week's TAL Update. This week, the Supreme Court passed on an abortion case out of Idaho, returning it to a lower court. The case involves Idaho's law that generally protects unborn babies from abortion, but allows abortions when pregnancy endangers a mother's life. The Biden-Harris administration challenged that law by claiming the exception conflicts with a decades-old federal law called EMTALA. EMTALA requires hospital emergency rooms to treat patients even if they cannot pay. But Biden claims EMTALA requires abortions in far more than rare life of the mother cases. As you know, Texas has a protective abortion law with an exception to allow abortions to save women's lives, even when death is not imminent. In January, the Federal Fifth Circuit Court determined that our law did not conflict with EMTALA. We are confident the Supreme Court will determine that Idaho's and Texas laws do not conflict with federal law and that Biden is wrong. But it may be many months from now. A new study in the Journal of the American Medical Association, also known as JAMA, claims a link between Texas's rising infant mortality rates in 2022 and the 2021 implementation of SB8, the Texas Heartbeat Act. The authors suggest that abortion restrictions may have negative spillover effects on infant health. Pro-abortion media outlets like USA Today have uncritically echoed this claim. In reality, Texas has seen an increase in birth rates reflecting the success of our pro-life laws in saving lives. And we celebrate every life saved by SB8 and the Human Life Protection Act. With more births, it's unsurprising that there are also sadly more infant deaths, especially among those with fatal or life-limiting diagnoses received in the womb. Losing a child is heart-wrenching and we sympathize with families who have experienced such loss. However, no disease, disability, or disorder justifies abortion. It is wrong to discriminate against anyone born or unborn based on a disability or a life-limiting diagnosis. Babies with such diagnoses have value and worth, and they deserve every chance at life, which is the best and most compassionate outcome for both mother and child. Families caring for children with terminal illnesses or disabilities need support as do those facing infant loss. We've compiled resources on our website to assist these families. Losing a child is difficult, but aborting that child doesn't take away the loss, and it robs the unborn child and family of time together, however short that may be. When Texas Alliance for Life public policy analyst Deirdre Cooper's unborn child was diagnosed with trisomy 18, she never questioned continuing the pregnancy and birth. She says life is always the compassionate answer, even in the hard cases. Hear her and Bosco's full story here. And thank you for joining us. See you next week. Now that Roe has been overturned, many are asking, what about abortion in the hard cases? By the hard cases, they often mean when a mother is told her child is incompatible with life. I know from personal experience that these cases are not hard at all. In 2020, we were told that our unborn child had trisomy 18. Trisomy 18, or Edwards syndrome, is a severe chromosomal abnormality resulting in three copies of the 18th chromosome. It can be life-limiting or fatal. A high-risk physician asked us if we wanted to think about what to do. By this, she implied we might want to consider killing our child because of his diagnosis. We immediately told her that we loved this child and we would fight for him. We asked about treatment options. The doctor was surprised and asked if we needed more time to think about it. I said that killing our child was not an option. We fought for our unborn son for the next four months. By 36 weeks, Bosco's condition was worsening, so our induction was scheduled. We walked into the hospital hoping for a miracle, but knowing we most likely would not leave with a living baby. We knew we had done everything we could for Bosco. Sadly, our beloved son, Bosco Joseph Paul, died during childbirth on April 20th, 2021. He was delivered peacefully into my hands, adored by his brothers and sisters shortly after his delivery, and buried lovingly by our family and friends. Bosco was loved every moment he was with us. 
120 people came to Bosco's funeral mass to support our family and bear witness to the value of each human life and the enormity of our loss. His gravestone is an enduring sign that our son existed and his life, while brief, mattered. Bosco's diagnosis and death were unexpected and undesired events in our life, but unexpected and undesired doesn't mean bad. Loving him was not hard. People often say these are such difficult situations, but I disagree. There is nothing difficult about not killing your child, no matter his diagnosis. Losing a child is difficult, yes, but choosing to kill that child doesn't make it any easier. It isn't difficult to grasp the truth. No disease or disorder would ever justify intentionally killing one's child, born or unborn. Abortion supporters like to say, you don't know what you'd do unless you were in that situation. But this is not true. I've always known that I would never kill my child, no matter his diagnosis. I am grateful that we did not take the advice of those who suggested we abort Bosco. There is nothing compassionate about purposefully killing a child with a disability now so as to avoid dealing with his death later. So please do not use examples of fatal diagnosis like that of my son Bosco to justify killing unborn children with disabilities.